Well, good morning and welcome to any visitors that are with us this morning. We are always grateful to have anyone here at Southside and just hope you'll feel loved and encouraged uh, in our time together. Happy Father's Day. Appreciate uh, how many of you are just modeling uh, the Father in heaven to your homes and just grateful uh, for all of you men who I, I've watched you persevere in every high and stormy gale and you just continue to hold to Christ no matter what comes and we, we just thank you and, and love how you're glorifying God and fulfilling these roles and I, I pray don't grow weary, we're going to reap a harvest. As a church, we're studying through First Peter, uh, the current section that we're looking at, if you'll turn, First Peter 4, we're looking at verses 7 through 11. And this morning, we're going to take on part four of, of four, uh, Lord willing, and finish up this section. So if you're visiting, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to review so that you'll be able to kind of catch up with us. Peter's addressing a church that's under great persecution. It, it's been mounting and intensifying, and it's about to climax in many people who will be reading this letter, who will be martyred for the name of Jesus Christ, including the one who's writing this letter. He will be crucified upside down. Peter is seeking then to help the church endure, endure well the things that they are facing with this persecution. He wants to help them persevere through the hostility. Not only that, but to do it in such a way that the world will see Jesus Christ in them and that many would get saved and glorify God on the day of their visitation. And so this is something that really needs to take up our hearts as the winds are shifting in our own country, mounting persecution and degeneration in our society at large. And so what, what do we do? Do we, do we take up and fight our society to try to prove to them and show them where they're wrong and make them quit persecuting us and, and get, get them to live justly and humbly? Is that where we're to give our time? That's not what we've been learning in Peter. How are we to live in the midst of a hostile society when the government is not protecting us, but they're coming against us, when our bosses are cheating us and mistreating us and abusing us, and husbands who don't know Christ and are coming against their wives and being ugly and reviling? How, how do we respond to such ill treatment? Well, Peter has taught us humble submission and forbearing love in the midst of of this society like our great head, Jesus Christ, who was like a, like a lamb led to the slaughter. And while he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And he uttered no threats. He said, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn them the other. If someone tries to take your tunic, give them your coat as well. If an army asks you to carry a pack a mile, go the second mile. I tell you to love even your enemies. That's the kind of stuff that Peter heard from Jesus Christ, and that that is how God advances his kingdom, through the humility and the, the beauty of Jesus Christ being manifested in the hostility of a world that hates him. Because they will see that, and in you that you have a hope that they don't know anything of. And Peter says, they might ask you, what is the hope within you? What is it that makes you different from this society? And the answer is 1 Peter 2, 4, the cornerstone. What makes me different is all of my life now is built on Jesus Christ. All that he is, all of the blessings, I abide in him, I dwell in him, I get my energy, my power from him, my hope is in him, my salvation is in him. All of my life is built on the cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is your hope? It's Christ. What is, your, what is your, your, your future? It's Christ. Why are you saved? It's Christ. Why do you live the way you live? It's Christ. The cornerstone is what is our hope that is within us. And now Peter is going to turn from that in teaching us how then do we deal with each other in the church? That's how we deal with those persecuting us outside. Now Peter brings us inside. And we have learned how to manifest Christ outside, and now we're going to learn how to manifest Christ inside the church. And so let me read our verses before us, if you'll come with me. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 4. The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I'm reminded of James. He said we're to receive the word of God in humility. I pray there would be none who would fight the word of God this morning. I pray now that every heart would be humble as the word of God is proclaimed to their hearts. I pray that they would receive it in submission. I pray that all of us would not merely be hearers of this word this morning, God, but that we would be doers of this word. I pray that we would hunger for holiness. Give us clean hands. Let us be the generation that seeks the the face of God. Lord, I pray that every heart in here is burning to be holy to their God. For we learned in chapter 1, be holy for you are holy, O God. Lord, guide us now as we are learning the conduct within the church of God. I pray the response would be obedience from every one of your people here this morning. And Lord, if there be any who have come in who do not know you, that the word of God would open them up and show them that they are not those who know the living God. They, they profess, but they do not possess Christ. Oh, would this be the day of their visitation? God, would you meet us here and do what only you can do? I have a, a vision of this word, what it will look like when a whole church begins to obey what Peter is commanding by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray, give eyes for every believing heart to see the beautiful conduct within the church that you have called us. Help us to throw down the sin of our country and generation of independence and isolation and thinking that church is a building. Oh God, tear those things down in every heart this morning and let us see that this is a a church, is a foundation on the cornerstone with stones that interlink and our lives work together to build us up into the cornerstone, the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, do your work in our midst, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. The second coming is imminent. This whole section is being built off of that principle. The the summing up of all things is going to be in Jesus Christ when he returns. And so the end of the end days have arrived. We're journeying to this last major event of the Lord Jesus Christ in his second coming. And so what are we to do as the people of God in light of a a near soon return of Jesus Christ? Do we spend our days getting out the charts and the details of trying to figure out who's the Antichrist, what's the mark of the beast, who's the group from the north, and just spend all of our time on that? Are we to go buy generators and water and get ready for the end times? Are we to get more ammunition? Are we to quit our day-to-day business and sit on the rooftop and say nothing else matters? None of that is what the Word of God calls us to. How do we get ready for these days? Well, Peter's answer at first glance to me seems so ordinary, not spectacular, for the days that he is talking about is the return of Jesus Christ, and his answer is, keep our wits about us. Keep our our wits, our our minds clear and sober. Have moderation. Don't get drunk with this world and all of its enticements. Don't be drinking up the pleasures of this world as it says the end days. The people are going to just be drunk with all the pleasures of this world. Get get rid of that for the purpose, he said, of, of prayer. To be a people who commune with your God and you know him and you're you're dwelling and praying with God. In verse 8, above all. Now we move horizontal. What is above all? Well, be fervent. Have a stretching love for one another. Have a love in the end days when it, people get difficult. People get harder and harder and more difficult. And he says, love will cover a multitude of sins. We're to be characterized as blankets just covering sin. Yes, we, we love and we confront and we deal with sin. But I hope you're characterized as someone who's gracious, humble, and covers the iniquities, the weakness of all those who surround you this morning. And that love last week, Pastor Andreos then brought that we are to be a people who are hospitable without complaint. We're to be a a people 
to open up our hearts and our homes. So if, if you have large hearts like God because he first loved us, my door is open. And we open up our homes and we bring people in. I believe that Acts 2 was not just for the early church. Acts 2 is for the church of God. And they were daily together, breaking bread, contributing to one another's needs, helping each other in the journey. And I'm tired of just saying, this is America, it can't be that. This is Acts, this is God's plan and his program. And we are to open up, rip them open, get neighbors, lost people, believers. Our homes are open, our lives are open. We get them into our home. We, we got to get back to what God has called the church to be. And in the end times, Peter's going to say, you know what's going to be really important? Hospitality. Hospitality to, to get into each other's homes and help each other and, and encourage. So open hearts, open doors. And I'm convinced that crusades do not work any longer. You, you have a crusade at a stadium and 20 people show up. It isn't, that isn't how it's done. And the way that it's done is by taking, I think Ray said it, but the world is the, the, getting the world into the church comes through getting them into our homes. And so we're to open up our hearts to our communities and where we work and neighbors and all of these areas. And we're, that's how we're to, to get and to bring them into the kingdom of God. And so it's going to come through your home. If you don't have a home, you can come use mine. Just get out there and open your heart. Invite people. Bring them in. The kingdom of God, the end, the end is here. Quit using your homes for just yourself. Don't just use them as museums and make them pretty and all the different things, all the shows that teach you how to make your house perfect so no one ever comes into it. Stop. Get them in. Bring the gospel. Show the love of Christ. Get them into your homes. That's what happens in the end days. What are we to do? And then thirdly, why? Why? Why do we want to get them in our homes? Well, there's something really beautiful and crucial that happens when we open up our hearts and we open up our doors. God has given us some gifts that he has given to every believer for ministry. Every one of you have been given a gift from God for the purpose to minister to these people that we're going to bring into our homes and in our churches and in our neighborhoods. We, we have gifts from God so that the body can cause the growth of the body. The only way I'm ever going to grow is with all of your gifts. And I've got to be involved in your gifts. I need them if I'm ever going to grow up into the head. And so these gifts are all given so that when we get together in community, we're going to be built up and we're going to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. So there's something that God has given to each one of us. It's called a grace gift. And I want you to hear this. It's not for ourselves. It's not to sit alone and admire our gifts and use them on ourselves. If you have the gift of exhortation, it's not to just be spent on you. Service is not, I make myself lunch every day. I teach myself the Bible every night. I am so edified. So I've got the gift of administration. You should see my schedule. What I want you to see is these gifts are not for you. They're for the body of Christ. That's why they've been given to you. God has given us grace gifts to exercise grace to his body, the body of Christ, to be conduits of grace, the grace to flow into your lives to this body so that we will be built up into the head. And so I really do want you to hear this. It's not enough to sit around and say, I just love everybody and sit on your duff and do nothing about it. It's not just something in your heart. It's something that goes out. It, it's not enough to open up your door and have people in for a meal and say, I did hospitality. That is not it. There is something more that is to come from all of this. And it's to use our spiritual gifts that God has given us for the mutual edification of the body. I love you. And I will use all of my gifts for your good as the heart of the child of God. I will bring you in my home and I will show you the love of Christ and I will use the gift that God has given to me to help you in your way and your journey to your true home, heaven. I'll use it. In a persecuted region that's suffering greatly right now, with Peter writing this, he's saying, I'll bring you in my home to seek to restore your hope, this living hope that Peter's been writing about 
by the word of God through his spirit. And so in the end days, it's going to get difficult. It's going to get hard. I'm going to bring you into my home, and I'm going to, I'm going to help restore your hope into this coming king and what this is all about instead of thinking it's about these temporal things in this life. We're going to fight this with each other. I want you to be safe in an environment that covers sin. You you bring them in your home with gracious kindness. Don't beat on every wrong thing that they say. Or if their doctrine wasn't perfectly every I dotted and every T crossed, I'm just, uh, I'm going to devour you. That isn't going to bear fruit, I promise. I did it. Bring you you in and not complain. Don't grumble, he said. So I'm I'm, I'm not going to grumble the whole time you're there. You're coming in and you just feel home and loved and compassion. A place where people are edified and people flourish. A place called home. A refuge from this world. That's what I want a house for. A small picture of what heaven's going to be like where everybody loves one another. I, I want a little picture of that in my own house and in my local body. Do you see the beauty of what Peter's doing in this section? If we get this, there will be a great harvest as there was in Acts chapter 2. The passage closes, most importantly, is that God's going to be praised and glorified. And that is why I want you to to walk this path. I'm not after this, so you'll have me over for a meal. We stretch our love in the end days, and we open our doors, and we use our gifts so God gets all the glory. God will be glorified in people who love and live and act this way. It'll show the world a powerful God who saves. And everyone will worship and adore this God. My, my end goal is this beautiful glory of God. So what do you say? Let's dig into the details then of these two verses. And I want you to look at these spiritual gifts that God has given to us. And so our outline, just the, our controlling statement today, is God has given to each Christian catch this, a unique manifestation of his grace for the ministry to the body of Christ. And we're going to see that he does that by first looking at service. It's to be used, these gifts. It's a stewardship, he calls it. We've been stewarded with these gifts. And then I want to look at the supply of these gifts is that we are dependent completely on God for the exercise of them. And then I want to look at the summum bonum, of the, the end of all of this, as I just said, is the praise and glory of God. So let's look at these verses together. Look with me in verse 10. <clears throat> as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. So <clears throat> you receive this gift, and he says, what I want you to do then is employ it in serving each other in the body. The Greek word for serve is diakone, which is where we get the word deacon. And to wait tables. How can I serve you? I'm here to serve you. I want to use this gift for whatever you need in your journey to glory. And so he says, each one of you have received the gift. So every Christian has a special gift, spiritual grace gift from God. He's handpicked and given each one of you a very specific gift. And I think it ties into Ephesians 2.10, where it says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world so that we might walk in the good works that he's planned before the foundation of the world. So here's the works that God has predestined for you to do. Here's the gift I'm going to put inside of you to do those works. I'm going I'm to give you a gift so that you will do the very works that I have predestined for you to walk in. 1 Corinthians 12. Turn over there real quick. Keep your hand in Peter. I think this is worth just glimpsing quickly at. 1 Corinthians 12, I'm going to start in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. So there's a lot of variety, but the same God causing it all. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Why? For the common good, for the good and building up of the body of Christ. Verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, 
and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one, yet it has many members, all of us, and all of the members of the body, though they are many, they're one body. So also is Christ. And by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body now. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And so here's this gifting. The Spirit distributes to each one of you individually as we are all now one body baptized into Christ. And this is so beautiful. I've gone over it before. There's a universality of gifts. It's to everyone And yet, he says individually. And that Greek word is the word idios, and it means idiot. And an idiot then was just someone, when someone said you're an idiot, it meant there's no one else like you. And so, we're all spiritual idiots. Uh, Every one of us is, you're a spiritual snowflake. God has made you like no one else. He has put a gift in you, and there's no one else in this body just like you. And, and that is an amazing thing, that, that you have that uniqueness, and God has put you in this body for a purpose. And so the Holy Spirit, in perfect wisdom, for the works that you were created to do before the foundation of the world, what body that you would be in locally, and all of this was dispensed with a sovereign gift to you for what the body of Christ needs. This is beautiful. This is unbelievable to have a God like this who could know all that and dispense it. And it should get you excited to say, I've got something special to bring into the body of Christ that God gave me for the good of this body here this morning. The word gift here in Peter's in the singular. And so it's, a, it's each one, you have a gift, it's unique. And it's unique by your experiences. And so if you have the gift of teaching you, your whole life, and you, you might have the gift of mercy or exhortation, and there's all these different things that are going to make you unique and different than anyone else. We have a bunch of teachers at this church, and they're all completely different. That's why I like to sit under all of them. I just love the differences in how they teach and where you're going to go. And so there's just all these different gifts there's gifts in service and how you're wired. I have a son who, he, he just always notices needs and he's on it. And I'm just sitting there clueless, not spotting any of them. And just like, how does he notice these things? Well, it's a gift. It's a gift because he wasn't that way when he was unregenerate. He was a selfish little toddler wanting his <laughs> own ways. Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> <clears throat> so do you realize if you don't use your gift... The body of Christ will not be all that God designed it to be. That's big. That's powerful. It matters if you sit on your gift and hide it. It matters to God, and it matters to me. It matters to this body. You can't sit on them. They were given by God for a very specific purpose and use. And he says each one has received. It's in the aorist active uh, it's like a little snapshot. You received this gift. So when you were, were born again and believed that you were given this gift, and so you don't get them later, you can't try to f- work hard and figure out how to get them. It was a gift. You didn't pray for it. You didn't work for it. You didn't pursue it. You received it. And it's why it's called a gift. And it was given to you by the determinate will of God. And you have received it. It has been bestowed upon you, brother or sister in Christ. You have received it. It's been given to you. And and, and Peter says it's a a special gift. The Greek word is charisma. You've been given a charisma, a, a gift of grace. Every one of you have been given a graciously given mode of ministry energized by the Holy Spirit. Every one of you have that gift. It's a gift to minister to the body of Christ. In Romans 12, Paul says, don't think too highly of your gift. Don't, don't get excited about you because it's a gift from God. And don't think too lowly and say, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. He says, you, you need to use this gift. Whatever he has sovereignly dispensed to put into you, you are to use it faithfully for his glory. 
So what do we do with it? This is the gift that keeps on giving. Employ it in serving one another. It's pretty simple. It's to be used, right? It's a command. This is a command to the children of God. It's not a suggestion and it's not a wish. You have received it to use it for the body of Christ and its mutual edification. And I don't really think any of this is very confusing. I've been asking myself all week then, why do so many today in the American church, and I'm going to narrow it, why do so many even today in Southside Bible Church not use their spiritual gift that God has given to them? Why? The the end days are here, guys. We're, We're in them. And, and I don't want my love to grow cold like Jesus said will happen. I, I don't want to leave Christ for my love of this present world like Demas did. I need you guys. I need your gifts to be exercised for me to grow up into the head. I want to be found in him, longing for his coming and ready and prepared, not drunk with this world and lost. I need these gifts. And so we, we just have this powerful command with a therefore. Do you remember? In verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, this is why we're to live this way, in light of that he's coming. Why are people not walking in the truth? Why are we not obeying this? Here it is. Therefore, Jesus could come back today. Be ready. Be doing these things. Okay? Pray. Fellowship body life, all of these things that we're looking at. Open up your homes. And so some of the answers that, that I just prayed this week going, Lord, how do I shepherd our flock that, to get, I, I want, there, there's some of you who are getting this like never before and some of you who are still sitting on your hands. And I just, God, how, what do they need? Why won't they serve? And so I'm praying and here are some of my answers. And I hope I get a couple of your questions and hit them between the eyes. Stay, I'm going to stay in the passage. That's always wise. <laughs> the end of all things is near. I think it's because we're not living with that blessed hope. I think we've bit into the American dream, and our hope is this. And we're not living for Jesus Christ coming back and returning. And I'm not ready. I'm not being found ready when the king returns. is isn't even on my radar. I didn't even think about it this week. If the king comes back, will I be found serving when he returns? The American dream is my pursuit, not the consummation of all things in Christ. Second, our text says that we're to have a sound mind and sober spirit. We're sipping all day long on the alcohol of this world. And so if I serve you, I won't have me time. I can't do my hobbies, my TV shows, my workouts. You know what drunks do? They dissipate time, they squander it, and they waste it. And I'm so busy drinking up this world and everything that it has, I got no time for the body of Christ. I can't serve anybody because I got my me time, and that's what matters. Well, you know what? I took up my cross, and I died. I was crucified, and me time ended. It's you time. My life for yours. That's the call here, and we're so drinking up and taking in all this world that people are not serving one another because they're serving their own consumption and self ends. Third, have a fervent love that covers. We don't cover. I'm gonna lay, I'm gonna lay out my life and use my gifts on people that I don't even love and they frustrate me. I think it's why we're buying more and more dogs and cats. They, they, if, they, if a dog bites you, there's a reason. If people do, there's, a lot of times there's not even a reason. And, and I can get along with a cat and a dog way better than humans. And so I, I think that our fervent love that is just to be stretching and growing is not. And the reason we're not serving one another is because we don't have this fervent love and a love that covers when people are difficult and hard and I'll still keep washing feet and I'll still keep using my gift. To to sit around on your little perch and say how everybody's this and that and wrong and that's why I don't engage in the body of Christ is just sin. And I really think that we don't have a fervent love that stretches and covers. Hospitality. It's hard to use my gifts on Sunday and the whole church assembled. Uh, Get them into your home where your gifts will flourish. 
Get, get them in your homes and, and start using your gifts. And I, I've had people say, you know, I, I'm boring. I don't like people in my home. I don't, just, I'm telling you, get people in your home and let God begin to do what he does. And there's a gift within you that you can encourage people with what God has put inside of you. I don't know what my gift is. I hear that often. How, how do you find it? Well, the church for a long time, it gave us these beautiful tests that you could take. I, I took them when I was first saved. Uh, and then you figure out what your gift is, and then you go use it the rest of your life, and you don't have to do anything that's not your gift. It's kind of nice. I, I can't help you move. I don't have the gift of that. <laughs> I like better what the Puritans said. The Puritans said, get in the body of Christ and serve and look back and say, oh, that's how God uses me. Instead of sitting there forelooking for all of your days, what's my gift? What's my gift? That he says, give yourself to the body of Christ and you will learn and see what your gift is. If you can't use your gift until you figure out what it is, you're just going to sit and wonder all of your days and you're going to squander this gift. People have asked me, what is your gift? And, and my genuine answer is, I don't really know. I thought it was preaching, but you guys have encouraged me enough over the last years that I know it's not that. <clears throat> I know there's some kind of mercy that God's put in there and encouragement. Ray said, if you look in my eyes, you'll say yes to whatever I'm asking. I, I couldn't even find that on a list, Ray. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But are, are these gifts given to you at birth? Are they given to you at the new birth? Does your life and providences tie into it? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I want you to hear this. I don't spend any time thinking about it either. I just know what God, that God gives us all gifts individually, what? For ministry. And so I open up my heart to this body. I open my door and I seek needs by his spirit and try to do anything I can to help you in your journey to glory. And so maybe just a vulnerable confession. I didn't even want to be a minister. I wanted to play in the NBA. That was my dream as a kid and all the way into college. In my first year of college, I got injured. My whole world fell apart. And in that season, God saved me. And I joined my girlfriend, who's now my wife. I went to her Baptist church. And all, if I heard a need, I jumped on it. And I started doing a lot of moves. Uh, and one day they said, hey, would you teach the youth? I, I don't know how to, but yeah, I'll try. Uh, I don't recommend that. We don't do that here. Um, <laughs> But for me, it worked. And God just kept opening up doors and, and more and more needs. And I'm just telling you, dig in and let God use you. You know what? I quit looking at what my gifts were and just looked at what the needs were around me. And that's what Peter said, employ it in serving one another, another for our common good. Get in and use these gifts on the body of Christ. Maybe at my funeral, you guys can figure out what my gift was. I'm not going to worry about it. But the last reason I thought of is why we might not serve them, as I hear a lot, is I don't have opportunity. I, I need opportunity. And that, to me, that's kind of like walking into In-N-Out Burger and saying there's no opportunity to buy a burger and eat it. That's all they do. <laughs> they don't do anything but burgers, right? I think that's it. They don't do anything but burgers. And if you commune with God and you seek holiness, and you open your heart truly to this body and cover sins, if you open up your house and get into community groups and discipleship relationships, you will find ways to use your gifts. There's a million needs in this body. Get in, and you're going to find them. To sit back and just say, I don't have any opportunities, that doesn't work. There are plenty of ways to plug in here and serve. We'll help you. But what we have said from day one, here's a directory, start. Go get people in your home. Go meet them. Help them. If you isolate yourself, your gift will sit stagnant. And on the last day, you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an accounting, which is my next point. Verse 10. Our second point then is first one is serve. Secondly, it's a stewardship in verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, and I just want to apologize is that the clock is broken uh, this morning. So I have no clue what time it is. Amen. Okay? So I don't know if that's my problem or your problem, but it is a problem. 
There was a famous football coach who said on a Sunday, there's 44 people in desperate need of rest who are playing football, and they're being watched by 80,000 people in desperate need of exercise. <laughs> That's the church today. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, this gift is an expression, uh, this Greek word is God's multicolored grace. This is God taking his, his, his uh, what, do you, what do you paint with? Where's Haley? Paintbrush. <laughs> you take the paintbrush and you have all these paints and you just sit there and he's, he's drawing this beautiful Monet of all of us. His workmanship, remember that Greek word was poema. He's making a poem out of your life. And each life has this gift perfectly that's been given to you by God. And you're to stewardship over this a beautiful gift of grace that God gave you to minister to his body. You're a steward over this gift. It's not yours. Isn't that beautiful? It, you're a steward. You're a manager over what belongs to God. What he has given to you, you're to manage it. It's not yours. You're just a steward over this grace that has been freely given. So you're not free then to do with it whatever you want. It's not, hey, this is mine, and I'll use it whenever I want. No, you're a steward. And this gift belongs to God, and how you use it matters to the one who owns it. You've been entrusted with it, and what is it for? It's for the church. And I'm going to read a parable that... You just need to hear, and I'm sure you've heard it your whole life, but may the Spirit give us ears to hear this morning in Matthew 25. For it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. So he'll give different degrees of talents. So you're not, if you have one talent, you don't have to be a ten-talent person. So he gives different degrees to his own ability, and, and he went on his journey. <clears throat> Immediately, the one who received the five talents went and traded with them, and he got five more. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. He sat on his hands. And now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. That's the soon return of Jesus Christ. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master... You entrusted me with these five talents. I've gained five more. And his master said, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. What a beautiful day of reckoning. His master said to him, well done. Uh, and then the, the one who had received the two talents came up and the master said, uh, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Here's the gift pack that you gave me with zero fruit. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have taken my money and put it in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have at least received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has shall more be given, and he who shall have an abundance, but from the one who does not have, even what he does not have shall be taken away, and he'll be cast out, that worthless slave, into the outer darkness, and in that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think if I said that, most of you would walk out of the room. Jesus is saying the one who squandered and didn't use this gift at all. He's going to be cast out into this outer darkness, and there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You tell me if God cares about what we do with these gifts that he's given to us. And so as your pastor, I, this burdens me so much to not let you sit on your hands until the king comes back. This is so serious. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be pestering and pushing and exhorting you here this morning. It matters what you do with these you can't keep ignoring your grace gift that God has given to you for this body. It's neither safe nor wise. And I pray that you would hear what the Spirit says to the churches this morning. These gifts were given to serve, to employ it. They were given as a stewardship that we're going to give an account 
for. And thirdly, I think probably the most important of the first three is the supply uh, to use these gifts. And that there's a dependence upon God with these gifts that he's given. I love that he doesn't just give us a gift and now we go use them in our own strength. That these gifts, the fuel, the only way they work is through the Holy Spirit. That, that, that you, you don't have your own energy to just go run and do them. They've got to be empowered by God. So l- let's look at them in verse 11. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utter- utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. <clears throat> so whatever your gift is in, it must be exercised in dependence upon God. So if you can speak speak the words of God. And if you have the gift of service, use the strength that God provides in serving. And so Peter didn't give us a big list here, did he? Just kind of two big, broad categories. Speaking, communicate the words of God. Serving, compassionate acts of service. And so let's look at the two broad categories. Whoever speaks is to do as one who's speaking the very utterances of God. This, I think this carries the idea of kind of an authoritative speaking. Uh, Christian worship, preaching, teaching, prophesying, tongues and interpretation, ministries that are verbal at this time. So if you speak, let it be the words of God. If you have this gift, you better depend upon the word of God. Okay? Depend on my word, says God. This is not I have the gift of gab. I've got a sense of humor. Uh, I tell good stories. I'm captivating. I'm intelligent. I have a high intellectual level. I just want you to hear this this morning. This is not coming up with a novel idea. It's not your own wisdom. It's not giving us your latest research. This is the one who is wholly dependent upon the Word of God. If you're going to spend any time in this body, anything you do in teaching and communicating and exhorting, it better be the Word of God or it's not any good. That doesn't mean there isn't other truths outside of it. I'm saying it will not build us up into the head. We need to take this word and everything we say in discipleship, exhorting, teaching, preaching, it is the word of God. And so if you speak, better be the words of God. You're gonna give an account for your teaching. You better be slow to be a teacher because was it the word of God that you were speaking? Somewhere along the way, the church in America has lost this. It says in the end days, we're going to accumulate teachers for ourselves that will tickle our ears and tell us myths. That Greek word is fanciful stories. We're going to get teachers that will just entertain us and tell us stories, and that's going to become the church in those end days. But when you preach and teach, you better read the text and explain it, illustrate it, and apply it. I love watching the young men that we keep giving opportunities to preach up here and they get up here and they depend on that word and they just try to teach it till they get down. God bless you. Dependence upon the text and listeners demand that the text be taught and understood. That is what God uses to transform us into the image of Christ, the word of God. We can't outdo Steven Spielberg. But we have something this world doesn't have, and it's the Word of God, and we teach it and we preach it in every angle that we can bring it. The power is in the Word, being understood, illumined by the Holy Spirit to change and transform His people. It's not in my cool and amazing way of preaching it. Just get over that. Depend on the Word. And you get revivals like Luther's and Calvin's who stood in the pulpit day in and day out and dryly preached the text again and again. We've lost confidence in the simple explanation of God's word to change lives. And we're wrong to want more from our teachers. I want the word plus. So if you have this gift, earnestly desire to be pleasing to God by getting to the meaning of the text and hunger for the salvation and sanctification of those who are listening to that word, which presupposes one thing, a life committed to understand God's word. If you've got the gift of teaching, you better be studying this word and giving yourself to being a student to it all of your days. You never are going to master this book. It's infinite and eternal. Give yourself to it so that when you speak, it's the utterances of God. This is not a gift that is downloaded, and now you can wing it whenever you get a chance and just say, oh, I've got the gift. Call me anywhere, and I'll just get up, and I can wing it. You better never fall into that. Secondly, 
the other broad categories if you have the gift of serving. We need more of this than teaching. This is the body life and all that goes on. Administration, ushers, finances, facilities, baptisms, communions, music, media, website, taking care of infants, greeters, fellowships, visiting the sick, benevolence, set up, tear down, food, bulletins, moves. It just goes on and on. This is the life of the body. And the Corinthians were fighting because they wanted the showy gifts where they were put on display and people would see it and they were despising these other gifts that weren't as noticeable. And he says, you better realize, forget that, love edifies, love is what builds up the body of Christ. So you need every part of the body for the body to cause the growth of the body. If all of us aren't putting our gifts in and being used, the body won't grow the way it should. So we all have to jump in. So this isn't just, uh, I have people say, isn't it just rolling up your sleeves? Just roll up your sleeves and, and go do it. I had a mentor of mine share something that acted me. He said, strength, do it, as Peter said, in the strength that God supplies. This is not done in my own strength. This is done by his power. And that sounds real pious, but I don't need his strength to wipe a table after a potluck, pastor. Well, I'm gonna tell you, after 30 years of ministry, I've come to see something dangerous in the body of Christ, and it's called burnout. It's burnout where you've served and used your gifts, and you've overdone it, and now you're just all burned out, and I'm done. I'm like like Martha. Lord, don't you care that I'm the only one working? I got insensitive elders demanding all these things, and ministry abuses and exploiting. I, I paid my dues when I was younger. Let the young guys do it now. That is the the service that was not done in the strength that God provides. It all started with, I don't need God's power to wipe off a table. That's where it begins. Yes, you do. You need it to have a joyful disposition for the privilege of serving the body of Christ and doing it in love. If you just do it in your own strength, you're going to dry, you're going to fall apart. This is going to be those who make it to the very end using their gift when the king returns. It's the gift that he supplies. That Greek word meant to pick up the tab. He picks up the tab. God will give all the physical, emotional, and material needs for service. Stretch yourself a little bit to where you can't do it naturally and you gotta depend on the supernatural. It's amazing to watch God work. I just keep at it, making meals. We got some ladies in here that are unbelievable. I've watched them for 20 to 30 years making meal after meal for people in need and the needs of the body. And I've never seen anything but these sweet smiles. And it it seems like it's a privilege for them to make me dinner when I'm in need. That's the stuff I'm talking about. Some of these people, my little girls come home after working in the nursery, just smiling, telling me stories about how cute the little kids are and what a joy it is to serve them. That's the spirit that we never want to lose, Uh, to, to not become bitter and say, no one serves like me and start grumbling. Guys, it's by his strength. And I look back after all these years of serving with a joy and wished I had served the body of Christ more And I roll up my sleeves with a little less strength in my older age, but I still roll them up with joy because of my love for this sweet body. That has to be his grace. That's what he's talking about here. Serve by the power of the Holy Spirit as I commune with the living Christ. It's an endless well of power for service as I abide in the vine and keep drawing from Jesus all that I need to serve this body with the gifts that he's put within me. Amen? And then the aim. And I I don't want you to miss this because this is why I'm standing here this morning. The the summum bonum of why we do all of this. Look in verse 11. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So I speak God's words. I serve in God's strength. And my aim is the good of others, yes, but that's penultimate. My highest aim in all that I do is him. That's how you know you've been born again. The highest aim for everything that you do and everything that you shoot at is for the glory of God. You will burn out in your service if this is not your ultimate end. I've watched it again and again. If your ultimate end is others, 
When they don't appreciate what you do, they don't notice, uh, you're even mocked or ridiculed, your home is a mess after a community group, a leader snubbed you, no one notices what you do behind the scenes, you're going to dry up, you're going to burn out because that's a human strength. This fuel can never run out. That has the glory of God as its chief end. Keep that as your ultimate end, and you will be able to run and serve and use your gifts for this body so that in all this, as you pray and open up your hearts and your doors and serve, God's going to get the glory because what goes on here when people see this is they're going to see the kingdom of God. They're going to see the glory of a saving God. Doesn't that motivate you? Jacob said he served 14 years for Rachel and it seemed like a day because of what? His love for her. I wish I could serve this body more because of my great love for God. Isn't that beautiful? I love him. I want to close with one example and then we'll, we'll pray. That this section has kind of been flowing through my heart. On Tuesday night, we started a discipleship group for the college and career uh, young men and women and we had like 50 people show up to our house for this. And there's some ladies who come early and they've prepared the meal and they got everything ready. And then the, the young kids, I call them kids. They, I'm going to say kids. That they'll come in and what I love about them, they'll bring a bag of Oreos or something they picked up on the way. And everybody's just bringing what they have and what they got. And they start eating and the fellowship is so warm, you can just feel it through the whole house. And then there's a sweet kid named Thomas. I said, Thomas, would you mind leading worship? I just feel like worshiping. No notice. Grabs his guitar, sings two songs, and it, it was so perfect. And the kids were singing loud and clear for all to hear. And my neighbors, you know, are all just like, what's going on over there? Are you guys having kegers? And we're like, no, we're just opening the Word of God. That's all that's going on in this house. And then the guys go downstairs, and the girls go upstairs, and they're taught and the leaders that God raised up to disciple, because I'm with the guys, the young men, is so beautiful. Their gifts are so varying from, from drug addicts to homeschoolers. To, it's just, they're all different. But they come together and we're laboring as one <clears throat> to see these men grow and glorify God with the days that they do have on this earth. And so we're so unified and fighting. And then we break up into these prayer groups. And, and as we pray... My group is, is just so knit. We've only done it for two weeks. And one of the guys in my group lost his dad in college. <clears throat> he battled depression. His, his career has taken a huge hit. He has so many things. But he has grown so much in these last few years. And he's counseling. He's encouraging us with this wisdom that's unbelievable of what he's learned in his trials and his journeys. And then there's this younger man he was just sharing of a temptation that came at work, and he was like Joseph. He, he fled from it, and in his, in his sweet way, he said, I, I just want to glorify God with my life. And, and the tears start streaming down all of our faces with his simplicity and devotion to God. And the other guy just rips open his heart saying, man, I just want to be honest and lays it out so that we can just all open and minister, and we're just praying for one another then with such passion and, and the bond is so sweet with the four of us. With, with the goal is that every young man and woman would have a mentor when we finish this summer. And now these kids are pouring into our youth kids and our elementary kids teaching Sunday school. This is 1 Peter 4. And it's changing my life. And it's helping me to live in light of the end days that are so near being focused on him and him alone. And when we all do this, I'm telling you, is you're going to see Acts 2. And there's going to be people saying, what is the hope within you? And they're going to start, they're getting, they're getting saved left and right because they see the power of God. So this is going to give God glory. If we'll live this way, he, it'll all end up just praising and worship and glorifying God. So Peter was brilliant as he was led by the Spirit to say the end times are here. These aren't insignificant things. These are what God uses to keep us and grow us and sustain us and bring others into the fold in these last end days. So may we give our hearts to this and never grow weary. And dads, this is what I, what I, what I see in this passage, this is fatherhood. Is if you'll be these kind of dads, your kids will grow up seeing the beauty of the body of Christ and they'll love the body of Christ. My kids have told me, I, I don't want to leave Southside because they're my family. And I'm just like, you sure you don't want to go? 
And they're just like, no, this is my family. I, I don't ever want to go. And I'm telling you, is get, dads, just model this. Show it. Love it. Let your kids see how beautiful the body of Christ is. And, and I'm telling you, God, God blesses those things. So let's, let's pray, and I will dismiss you. And I went late, so you'll be the last ones to get to, to the lunch places on Father's Day. Blame, blame it on me. Father, I come before you, and I thank you for this beautiful passage. God, I just want to pray for all the dads. I pray for the ones who are tired and weary, Lord, that you will refresh them and strengthen them. I thank you once again that all of us come short as dads. Let anyone who is sitting under that failure and paralyzing them, set them free this morning. God, there's only one. We're trying to to model the perfect father in heaven. And so God, thank you that we we do come short, so they're going to want something better than us. And so I pray, let us keep showing what little glimpses we can of the eternal father who's so good and perfect. And so I just pray that all the dads would just keep seeking you to to model a a weakness that would never let go of you and just kept seeking you in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil. So please, God, lift hearts and encourage dads to not grow weary. I pray for any unsaved children that they have. God, we're praying for a massive harvest that you would open eyes and save these children. Lord, bring them to yourself. (laughs) Bring salvation. And I pray for the ones who are saved, God, that you will just keep building and growing them up to become just ministers of of this truth of Jesus Christ in their days, that they'll obey 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11 all of their days and their journey. God, I pray for those who have lost fathers this morning. Lord, I pray for the, the pain that they're feeling. Lord, let them just be blessed by the memories that they have Uh, If they were believing dads, oh, the the joy that awaits them to have this perfect relationship and glory. God, I pray uh, for those who um, are are dads and and kids aren't believers. We do pray that you would save them. God, I just pray that all all the fathers that are sitting here this morning would renew their strength. Lord, let them not grow weary. I don't care how old their children are. Lord, let them just continue to, to know you and make you known with the days that they have. Don't let anyone say, I've blown it so bad. Lord, let that lie be done. Let us forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So strengthen all dads for wherever they're at and their journey here this morning. God, I thank you for these men. I love them dearly and pray that you'll meet each one of them in the place that they need this morning. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen.